everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Welcome to our 114th Wedding Online Sports Economics Seminar. Uh, I'm joining you from uh, Manchester City, where I'm at the International Football History Conference, uh, but taking a, a break, uh, a, a break that I'm looking forward to, as we have Pete Gruhus uh, talking from the Appalachian State University on positional segregation and career length in Major League Baseball in the 1990s. Um, yeah, no reason for me to say anything else other than Pete, please do uh, go ahead, uh, share your screen and uh, take away your talk. Okay, let's see once again how to do this. Share screen. I just did this. Now, oh, come on. <laughs> Here it is. And Yep, and then if you slide show from beginning. Perfect. OK, uh, thanks so once again for in, uh, inviting me to present our research. Um, this has always been a good way since COVID to kick off a Friday. Um, so Johnny and I decided to look at an old data set in the 1990s to see if it could shed light on what's going on in baseball today. And just before the World Series, this article came up. Uh, no US born black players expected on World Series rosters. Uh, if you watch the uh, World Series, you see that there was a lot of racial diversity. However, there were no black players that had been born and raised in the United States on the rosters. Uh, so our motivation came from that. Uh, if we look at the percentage of U.S. born black players, it had fallen from 18 percent in the late 1980s to only 7 percent today, while the percentage of Hispanic players has risen from 14 percent in the 1980s to 30 percent today. So 30 percent of uh, uh, baseball is now uh, Hispanic and or Latinos. Uh, our data allows us to look at this time period to see what was going on with the rise of Hispanic players and the fall of non-Hispanic black players. Uh, I found this uh, graph and um, I, th I think this really points out to what's going on. Uh, 1947 was when uh, the color line was, uh, that was when Jackie Robinson came into the league. And from 47 to 93, we saw a rise of both uh, Latinos, which is the red line, and a rise of African Americans, but they started falling. Like, kind of like I said, the peak was in about 19, mid 1980s, and then it's fallen to 6% today. Uh, we kind of know why this happened. This, uh, Johnny found this quote from the Sports Illustrated in 2003. Uh, parents are doling out 5,000 to have their sons play on travel teams and uh, multiple sets of fancy uniforms and up to $500 to attend show showcase camps in which they walk away with promotional CDs and their sons and up to $60 an hour once or twice a week. So what this is getting at is it really is expensive to train players. And so it ends with, we've lost them by age 13, said Dijon Watson, director of professional scouting for the Indians. So it's very expensive to train to be a baseball player. And so even as early as 23, which is kind of the end of our data set, uh, they were already aware of this. At the same time this was taking place, there was something called baseball academies that had opened in Puerto Rico and other Latin American countries. Puerto Rico, which is a, a, a territory of the United States, as well as uh, the Dominican Republic is. And this is a quote from the Dominican. Latinos will comprise 30% of the ba Major League Baseball rosters on opening day 2019. Uh, in large part because Major League Baseball has systemized its recruiting and development program in the Caribbean over the last 25 years. In some ways, the academy system has been a win-win for Dominicans and Major League Baseballs. In 1990, the start of our data set, a team signed 281 boys, pay paying them a total of $750,000. Most received between $2,000 and $5,000, a small fortune. But by 2009, aggregate bonuses for foreign-born prospects soared to 70 million, 
most going to Dominican players. So we kind of know that there, there was a training difference, but we thought it was worth looking at the league to see what was going on. So the focus of our study is to look at positional assignment and career length to determine if there's evidence of positional stacking or exit discrimination in Major League Baseball in the 1990s. Our study analyzes if um, our analyst analysis may shed light on the changing ethnic and racial makeup of the league. We focus particularly on the nationality of Hispanic born players. Uh, to kind of jump to the conclusions, we find evidence of positional uh, segregation, particularly of US born black players and exit discrimination for foreign born Hispanic players in the 1990s. Uh, positional segregation may, may or may not be due to discrimination. It could be due to other factors such as the training or human capital formation. Um, now, the literature review of where this kind of fits in. Uh, we're, what we're trying to do is determine career length. Um, I, Hogue and Rasher back in 1990 looked at basketball data and found evidence that uh, white players had longer careers than black players. Uh, Rich Hill and I uh, uh, looked at that. Well, actually, let me say one more thing about Hogue and Rasher. Ratcher suggested that exit discrimination was caused by the diminishing pipeline of white players. And so teams were holding on to white players longer than they would black players because the pipeline was drying up. Uh, we, uh, Rich, Rich Hill and I, uh, using longer data and later data, discovered there was no uh, exit discrimination in our 2004 article. Uh, we redid it again in 2003, looking both at exit discrimination and pay discrimination and found no exit discrimination, but did find that white players earned more, slightly more over their careers uh, than black players. And then Johnny Ducking, uh, myself and Rich used uh, NFL data and found no evidence of exit discrimination for defensive players and offensive players. Uh, we excluded quarterbacks in our analysis and uh, offensive line, but we found no evidence of exit discrimination. So career lengths were the same. Now, in terms of this study, uh, we use the same data as Rich and I did in the 208, uh, 208 study. Uh, Jabu, just like Hoying and Rasher, had used shorter data sets and in Jabu found evidence of both um, exit discrimination against Hispanic players and exit discrimination against black players. Um, we using a longer data set that in included both short careers and long careers found no evidence of exit discrimination for black players or Hispanic players. Uh, we decided to use the same data um, in this Jabu and uh, in my uh, growth ice and hill, uh, positional controls were not included. Uh, we actually were just trying to replicate Jabu with uh, more recent data and longer data. So we decided, uh, Johnny and I decided to use the same data and try to look at um, it in more details. Um, since that time, uh, we started to do exit discrimination uh, on foreign born players. Uh, Dupkin, Duckin, and myself uh, looked at hockey data and found that Euro European-born players have shorter careers than North American-born players. North American meaning both Canada and the United States, uh, holding performance constant. And Russian players had uh, the shortest careers of all. Uh, in this article, we suggested, although we call it exit discrimination, it could be that Europeans and um, uh, Russian players are pulled back to their countries to complete their careers in foreign leagues. So we actually call it uh, ex um, career length pushing and pulling on Europeans. So it's not, it could be uh, the exit might be uh, decided by not the team, but by the player as they leave early. Uh, and then um, Rich Hill and I looked at foreign born players in uh, the NBA and uh, discovered there's two paths to the NBA for foreign born players. One is to come to the United States and get trained in colleges uh, such as Akeem Olajuwon. 
Uh, and then the other is to uh, be drafted out of a foreign league uh, like Montumbo, uh, the Greek freak. Uh, I have trouble pronouncing his name. Uh, and what we find is foreign born players who play basketball in the United States do not have shorter careers, while foreign born players trained in foreign leagues do have shorter careers. Uh, once again, this could be pushing and pulling where they go back to their home leagues after having a successful career in um, uh, the NBA. And so, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, look at um, uh, where Hispanic players are born to see if that matters about exit discrimination. And then we're going to also add position. Uh, I know not all Europeans because uh, uh, know the baseball game, so I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, on defense, there are, one, are these positions. Uh, the pitcher and catcher are involved in every play. The first baseman pretty much stays on first base because uh, if you get a hit, uh, and it goes to the third baseman, the third baseman will throw it over to the first base. Uh, and so in terms of human capital development, the uh, center positions are the most. Left field, center field, right field, and first base, there's less um, human capital development of these leagues. As a matter of fact, uh, Madoff, uh, 1977, identified that the highest higher skill and development costs were for central positions of pitcher, catcher, shortstop, second base, and third base. So first base and the outfield don't have as much training costs. Matter of fact, he went a step further and said, in order of positions of decreasing relative costs, the most expensive development is of a pitcher, then a catcher, then a shortstop, then a second base, and then a third base. Uh, Madoff, uh, 1986 attributed positional segregation to the inferior socioeconomic status of blacks and not the and differential skill and development costs that they once again kind of the quote at the beginning is so expensive to be trained in sports if you don't have the income you're not going to be trained. Uh, Smith and Leonard described stacking as the placement of African American baseball players in non-central positions more often than they're pl placed in central positions. Uh, one explanation they offered for stacking is that individuals in charge, managers, don't believe that African American players have the ability to perform thinking tasks. Um, this is the same reason they suggest that in um, the NFL, there was a slower movement uh, of black players into the quarterback position. A uh, matter of fact, Johnny uh, Ducking and myself have an article that looks at um, uh, wage discrimination in the NFL and found the only time we found some wage discrimination was for middle linebackers in the defensive position. And that might also be do the same thing, that that's kind of the quarterback of the defense. Uh, another explanation they offered is African Americans may want to play in the outfield because they admire uh, previous players that played in the outfield. Uh, for instance, um, Hank Aaron um, broke the home run record of, of Babe Ruth and uh, he, he played in the outfield and he was a hero to many Americans and being, being African American, other people, other players might decide to follow him into that. Uh, position. Uh, uh, Mar Margolis and Pavillon uh, indicate that part of the reasons that they African Americans are placed in the outfield is due to job related skills such as speeds. And so I, uh, I might be speeds. Um, I know I've taught sports economics enough and uh, we sometimes talk about customer discrimination as causing sort of this. Uh, white fans uh, identify more with white players, and because the best seats are uh, more in the infield, they, they place um, African Americans in, in the outfield, or yeah, black players in the outfield, uh, because they're further away from the fans. Uh, I've always said that in my sports econ class, but when I went looking for uh, the article that I'm kind of citing, I never did find it. Um, also, Becker 
uh, employer prejudication. This is the idea that the managers are identified more with the white players and they might put them in the more thinking positions. Uh, I've already said that before, but it kind of goes back to Becker as well. Uh, and so that is the background. Well, so what we decided to do is use this data set from 1990 to 2004, which was right in the time period where uh, there was a big rise in Hispanic players and a big fall in uh, African-American black players uh, who were born in the United States. In our analysis, we include all positions except for uh, pitchers. And here's how we break down uh, race and nationality in this. In, in the original paper with me and Rich Hill, we, we had white, black, and all the Hispanics together. Uh, so white, black, born in North America, uh, North America being both the United States and Canada. And, and then we have Hispanics who were born in the United States, Hispanics that were born in Puerto Rico and U.S. territories, where uh, one of the major uh, has a lot of uh, baseball academies, and the Dominican Republic, uh, Republic uh, another um, a lot of baseball academies. I do want to note that Puerto Rico is a United States territory. Uh, they they uh, you have United States citizenship. Uh, and then we also included uh, all other uh, Hispanic uh, players in this other category because none of them were a large percentage, uh, Colombia through Venezuela. Um, and uh, once again, Hispanic is more of an ethnicity. Uh, Hispanics, uh, in terms of racial characteristics, there's Afro-Latinos, uh, indigenous as well as white uh, uh, so there's a big difference uh, so so there are black players that come from hispanic but but we've separated them out um, because it's more traditional and also um, that's what we've been seeing in terms of training uh, black players do not get the training where black players who are born in latin america do get some training uh, they, during this time period, there were Asian players in the data set from uh, Korea and Japan, but they were such a small number that we decided to delete them from the data set for this analysis. But the, the results do not change if you in, include them. Uh, so now the means of the variables. Uh, the, the number of observations is not the number of players, it's the number of uh, player years. Uh, so you'll notice um, uh, black players, uh, uh, the Hispanics are slightly uh, younger on average. Uh, black players slightly have longer um, experience. Uh, slugging average, about the same across the board. Um, oh, I get, yeah, once I should explain these things. A uh, slugging average is the amount of hits you get. Uh, it's home runs uh, equals a four. Uh, a triple because you get to third base, you get three, a double gets two, uh, one, so you, and then you divide it, so you get a slugging average of the at-bats. Um, slugging average is a positive thing. Now, one thing you'll notice, and this is kind of true for all baseball, is we have no defensive um, performance measures. All of our measures are where the baseball player comes to the plate. Uh, it's difficult uh, to get defensive measures. I know that there are errors, the number of mistakes you make in the field, and there's also golden gloves, but there are those are only for the best top players. So this is kind of following the pattern of most baseball research. Even though I talk about positions, um, it's more uh, the, the performance variables are, are at the offensive positions. Um, so slugging is a batting thing. Runs batted in is a batting. Walk is where you don't you you sit through pitches and if you get uh, four balls, you get first base without getting the hit. Uh, th those are all positive things, things that help win a game. A strikeout is where you sit at the plate and you don't hit the ball at all, uh, and you just get three strikes and you're and then you're out. Um, notice in this particular case. Um, 
Uh, that's a, a negative thing. A stolen base is when a, a player that is on base uh, runs to the other base without being thrown out. Um, and notice that uh, in stolen bases really kind of refers to speed. The, the, the faster you are, the more likely you're going to be able to steal a base. And, and this kind of correlates with the, the notion that black players have more stolen case bases per game. Notice it's a relatively rare event. Um, so, um, uh, let me see, stolen bases per game is a relatively rare event, but they they have the highest percentage and that that might point to the nature of this the uh, black players who make the league make the league because of their speed uh the games played uh notice that black players play more games uh, uh weight notice that weights are about the same but hispanics are about 10 10 pounds less uh and then then the, that's the number once again the number of observations and then we divide um uh, the the Hispanic category uh, into the four subsets: Hispanic USA, uh, Hispanic Puerto Rico, Hispanic Dominican Republics, and we find that Hispanics from the USA are the oldest. Um, Hispanic Hispanics from Puerto Rico have the highest um, experience. The slugging average is about the same across the board. Uh, and then notice that uh, when we break them up, there are what two hundred. Hispanics from the USA is the smallest percentage. Uh, Hispanic from uh, the Dominican Republic's the highest. Uh, now, how would they break down by positions? This is, gets to the notion of uh, positional stacking. If we look at the catcher position, which is the uh, highest cost training, 77% of uh, the players are white. 21% uh, are Hispanic and only 2% are, are black born. And that and that, that kind of points to the nature of training. Uh, first base, 64% white, 20% black, 16% Hispanic. Uh, second base, um, about 50% white, 22% black, 29% Hispanic. Uh, third base, 75% white, 9% black, 16% Hispanic. Uh, shortstop, 35% white, 54% Hispanic. There, uh, a lot of uh, the Latin American uh, Hispanic players come, come in at 50, 54%. Uh, only 11% are black. Uh, outfielders, 36% white, 44% black, and 20% Hispanic. Notice in this particular case, we can kind of already point to some natures of uh, positional assignment. Black players are much more likely to be in the outfield. Matter of fact, they're the plurality. And then uh, Hispanic players are at shortstop. Um, notice that that is a majority. Uh, now, for this study, we lumped together util utility infielders and um, designated hitters. And we probably shouldn't have done it, but it, that was my call as uh, the empirical analysis. Uh, the problem is they were both very small subsets, and so I added them together, but they do are very different people. A utility infielder is a highly skilled individual that plays first, second, third base or shortstop. And a designated hitter is someone who does not play any position in the outfield. And during this time period, this uh, a uh, designated hitter played only in the American League pitchers uh, in a designated hitter replaces the pitcher at the plate um, in the National League the pitcher at this time period hit as well uh, and so that's why there was a smaller number we need to separate those out uh, I'm aware of that now we break it down uh, if we look at the Hispanic category I then pulled it over and I broke them down into these categories and we found that uh, the uh, Hispanic, um, if we look at uh, the shortstop position where there's a majority of uh, Hispanics, 22% come from the D Dominican Republic. And uh, I, I can't read it because it's behind uh, the thing. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty big for Hispanics in other categories. A lot of those come from Cuba. Um, and then notice that the outfield is split out across the board. 
and the like. Now, first thing we look at is non uh, estimates of career duration. And the, we, we start off with something very simple. All we do is we uh, calculate the hazard rate uh, where H is equal to D divided by N where D is the number of players who leave th their career in whatever year it is, such as their rookie year or their 10th year. And N is the number of players who could potentially leave that career. So D divided by N is a percentage. The hazard rate can be interpreted as the probability the player will exit the league given that they have survived to some level of tenure. So it just tells you how many, uh, the percentage of players that leave in a particular year. And what uh, is interesting is a lot of players don't survive their rookie season. 26% of white players do not uh, survive their rookie season. 21% uh, of Hispanics do not survive. 23% uh, of Hispanic Puerto Ricans do not survive. 28% uh, of Dominican Republicans don't survive. Uh, and 28% of Hispanic uh, born in other places do not survive. The one place where there is a higher survival rate uh, probability of exit is black players. Uh, and it, if a black player makes the league, they're a, they're a lot less likely to leave their first year. Uh, one thing I'll note is in baseballs, to reach Major League Baseball, you go through the farm system, and that takes many years. There's, uh, there are um, A, then double A, and then triple A. So there's many years that you play in the uh, the farm system or the minor league system before making the major leagues. And it seems like the black players that make the league don't get qu cut quite as quickly. Uh, and then if you look at the white column, one thing you'll notice is it falls the next year and then it falls reaches kind of a minimum in the fifth year, only 13% leave the league, and then it starts to rise. Now we, we ended at the 10th year, uh, but there are longer careers. Some uh, The longest career in our data is 25 years. Uh, but to, to calculate this, you need, uh, there's, as you, as, as you get more and more experience, there's less and less players out there. Uh, but so you notice it kind of, it, it, um, it starts off, it falls, which is a minimum and then rises the black players across the board kind of just stays the same but we kind of uh I, I realize that the hispanic usa hispanic puerto ricans hispanic dominican republicans and hispanic others are all relatively smaller categories so they jump around but if you plot these out you get what's my brother-in-law called a bathtub plot the first time I did an exit discrimination paper, I was showing it to my brother-in-law who works for Ford, and he said, man, that looks a whole lot like uh, parts failures for the uh, Ford. Uh, he, he writes warranties for Ford, and he says that if there's failures, they tend to occur early, and then they level out, and then as uh, the part ages, it, there's a big failure rate right at the end. And that's how you write a warranty. And I said, so that's why I called the bathtub model. But it makes sense that the failure of rookies is relatively early. Uh, and then once you've kind of established yourself in the league, uh, you, you do fine for a period of time. But then age catches up with you. And as age catches up with you, you drop out of the, the league as you, as it goes up. So that's why it's called the bathtub model, because it falls initially, then it flattens out, and then it rises at the end as you your your body can't handle uh, sport anymore. Um, now, the one thing about this analysis is it doesn't control for performance at all. And so what we do is we calculate a semi paramatic estimate of career length that allows for career duration. Um, this technique was developed by uh, uh, two economists at the University of Kentucky uh, at the time. Actually, they were both my dissertation advisors, uh, uh, Mark Berger and Dan Black, and they were they were trying to calculate how you estimate a hazard function where you have some careers. If you look at the little graph at the bottom, I have uh, the, a box. 
the box is the length of the panel. So uh, there are some careers that start before the panel. And and then so uh, you might have somebody who starts back in 1984. So they're playing in their career six years before they enter their pan panel. And then I observed them from their six year career until the end of their career. Uh, so what we do is we just keep track of their tenure. So in the first year, uh, that would be six years of tenure. That we have some players that uh, we have their whole career. That's the the bottom line. Uh, and so I know when their their career started within the panel and it ended within the panel. And then there are some careers that start in our panel but do not end till after our panel. So we don't know when they end. Uh, but it turns out it's a relatively simple idea is if you just code a zero uh, for whether their career uh, um, continues and one when it ends and then you just keep track of tenure. So so a player that has played five years in to 2004 is continue playing. They all of their code coding is zero because they've never they did not exit during the panel. And it turns out because of this, um, all you can do, all you have to do is use the Cox model developed in 1972 that um, is a logit model uh, with um, the, the um, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, a constant that varies by year. But the problem when there's a constant that varies by year, and we have 25, uh, and the longest career is 25 years, that's a lot of dummies. And by the time you get to 25 years, there are very few players that have that much experience. And so what uh, Berger and Black suggest is you replace that 25-year um, dummies with um, 10 year, 10 year squared and 10 year to the fourth power and the fifth power. So it, it serves as a, um, a Taylor series approximation for that. And that's how we went about calculating it. We also calculated it with uh, uh, four, five and six and uh, it did not change the results. And because of that, we think five is a good approximation to control for, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it does it does just as well a job. So now, what did we find? In the first column, we pro we estimate the probability of exit. After all, the the one is for exit, where we don't include position controls. And the second one, uh, we include position controls. So let's take a look at the first column. Uh, we find that when you do not include position controls. Black players have no difference in exit probabilities than white players. That's what we had found in our Southern paper that Rich and I had done. Uh, the, the thing that is different is when you divide the Hispanics into the different categories, we find that Hispanic players born in the United States have no difference of exit than white players born in the United States or I'm sorry, North America. And Hispanics from Puerto Rico, a US territory also have no difference in exit. But Hispanic players born in the Dominican Republic and Hispanics coming from other foreign nations in, the, uh, in Latin America also have a higher probability of exit. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the magnitudes of those uh, uh, after I walk, walk through the table. Uh, now, the interesting result that we find is when soon as you include position control, black players, instead of experiencing exit discrimination, actually lower their probability of exit uh, after controlling position, after controlling for position. Uh, Hispanic players, uh, it's, they stay about the same. Uh, uh, Hispanic United States, and Hispanic Puerto Ricans, no difference in exit. Hispanic uh, Dominicans and, and Hispanics elsewhere, a higher probability of exit. And then if you look at, uh, notice um, the first column, there's no position controls, the second column's with position controls. So this column just looks at position controls. 
and the excluded category is catchers. So we find that first baseman, second baseman, third baseman, shortstops, outfielders, and utilities all have a higher probability of exit than uh, catchers. Now, it doesn't mean that catchers have um, longer careers. It's just after we control for performance. So performance is more important for all of these positions than for, for catcher. Uh, you might hold on to a catcher longer, uh, even though they might not be performing at the plate. Uh, and that's really what this is getting at. Notice that the outfield has the highest, or oh, actually uh, second base and the outfield have the highest um, in terms of magnitudes. And then if we look at uh, the performance variables, age, height, and weight, we find height and weight don't matter. Age does matter. And that kind of gets to the notion of the bathtub model. As you become older, the higher probability of exit. Uh, like I said, the slugging average run batted in, walks per game, those are all good things. And if they're good things in terms of increasing your probability of win, that lowers your probability of exit. Strikeouts are bad because it lowers uh, it. Uh, you're more likely to lose a game. So we see that that's yeah, increased. The more strikeouts you have, the, the um, uh, higher probability of exit. Uh, stolen bases, a good thing, it in increases your likelihood of winning. It uh, is negative and insignificant, uh, lowering your probability of exit. And also the more games you play, lowers the probability of exit. Now, what do these magnitudes mean? Well, we can convert them to a percentage. We find foreign born players born in the Dominican Republic have a 46 more percent more likelihood of exit. Foreign born players from the Dominican Republic, 43 percent more likely when can position controls. So notice that Dominican Republicans over 40 percent more likelihood of exit. Um, this could be due to. Um, exit discrimination. If we go back to um, Rasher's idea that this deals with the pipeline, there's a big pipeline of Dominican players coming in. And if there's, for some reason, there's such a big pipeline, you might dismiss these workers sooner. I'm not, that's consistent for, with that. If we look at Hispanic players that come from elsewhere, they even have a higher likelihood of exit, 67% with and without position controls if they come from um, Cuba and those other other categories. One thing we do find once again is Hispanic players from the United States or Puerto Rico do not have a higher likelihood of exit. Uh, if we look at the black players, we find that with no position controls, there is no difference in exit. But with position controls, they have longer careers and a 20% less likelihood of exit. Uh, if we once again go back to the uh, Rasher's idea, it could be, be as this pipeline was drying up of players, some teams held on to black players longer because they, there was none out, out there to, that, that were coming up. Um, it's consistent with that, but there, there are probably other ideas that, or other things that could explain that as well. Uh, if we look at the positions, we find that first baseman, second baseman, uh, outfielders, and all have a higher probability of exit. And so the reason we don't find it for black players when we don't control position is because black players uh, are generally assigned to the outfield where there's a higher probability of exit. And so it just kind of that, uh, it kind of, mass the idea that the the, uh, the position so we didn't find it in the original paper because we didn't control for position by controlling for position you find that well uh it is there now that is if, if you the working paper that we posted that's kind of where it ended uh but oh i'm sorry that's not true getting ahead of myself um uh, now what we wanted to do is look at uh the uh, positional assignment uh, so we use a multinomial logit model to estimate the positional assignment. Uh, to explore positional assignment, we uh, f utilize a multinomial logit uh, similar to SACS 
at all in 2005. They looked at it only with one season, 1998. Uh, in our panel, we used the whole panel to look at it. Uh, we decided to use catcher as our reference category here because it's the high, has the highest training cost and it's made up of uh, the majority of um, non-Hispanic white players, 77% uh, in that group. And so this LOGIT model uh, uses um, performance statistics and uh, height and weight and age to predict where you're gonna play. And what we find is black players are more likely to play first base, second base, third base, shortstop, and outfield. Uh, notice the bigness ma magnitude is in the outfield and the, the utility slash designated hitter position. Uh, the Hispanic uh, US born uh, more likely to play first base and shortstop. The biggest category is shortstop. Hispanic Puerto Ricans, uh, there's two negative. They're less likely to play first base than catcher, less likely to pay third base than catcher, more likely to pay shortstop. Uh, Dominican Republics, uh, more likely to play first base, uh, much more likely to play shortstop, a bigger magnitude. And um, Hispanic players from elsewhere, more likely to play first base, more likely to play shortstop, less likely to pay, play second base than play catcher. Um, what we do find is although height and weight do not affect exit, they do expect where you play in uh, on defense. If you are taller and heavier, you play first base if, than a catcher. If you're taller and lighter, uh, you play shortstop. If you're taller and lighter, you also play in the outfield. Uh, if you're shorter than a catcher and lighter than a catcher, you play second base. So we find that height and, um, height and weight do matter of in placement. We do also find that age of uh, sec second basemen tend to be uh, young, younger than catcher, uh, shortstops younger than catchers, outfielders slightly younger than catchers. Uh, if we look at experience, uh, we find some results there as well. Uh, if you recall at the beginning when we were dividing them up into categories, we said that uh, first base and outfielders uh, are the not the central categories uh, and that there's less training. One thing we do find is uh, outfielders and first basemen are where the best slugging averages come from. So if you have a higher slugging average, you, you're placed on first base and outfield and not catcher. Uh, we also see that for the utility. Uh, that's because we included the designated hitters there. Uh, we also find, well, if you look at second base and shortstop, you find that the slugging averages are really no, uh, no different than catchers, uh, but less runs batted in. Um, stolen bases, I'll kind of skip over a couple. Stolen bases are really uh, referring to speed. Uh, and you find that first basemen tend to be slower than catchers. Uh, Second baseman uh, and all, all the way across the board, uh, much more likely to be in those positions and catch you if you have stolen bases. Outfielders uh, have the highest magnitude. Uh, games played, uh, catcher is a very difficult position and because of that, they don't play as many games and, and so they play more games than all other positions. Uh, if we inter we can interpret these as magnitudes, and what we find is compared to a catcher, the odds of being a first baseman is nine to one over being a catcher, seven to one over being uh, a second baseman, four to one for a third baseman, six to one for a short scot, and 29 to one to being an outfielder. So notice there is stacking of black players in the outfield. This result uh, shows that black players are stacked, particularly in the outfield, and uh, seldom catchers, even con after controlling for uh, size and performance statistics. Uh, when we look at Hispanics, because um, they're kind of all over the place, I decided to focus mostly where they're at, and that is shortstops, uh, because they make up a plur plur 
plurality of shortstops. We find that uh, U.S. born Hispanics are six to one more likely to be in a catcher. Um, a Dominican, a two to one to be in a catcher and uh, Puerto Rican two to one. Uh, uh, you, uh, yeah. And now that is kind of where the paper ends if you look at the one cent. But Johnny and I decided to take it one step further and um, I kind of call it slicing and dicing the data. Um, the problem when you slice and dice the data is sometimes it gets really too small, but we decided it was worth doing. And so we uh, decided to do the semi paramedic analysis of duration for each position. But the problem is when you get so small a data set, um, you're, you, you might not end up with many observations. Uh, for instance, uh, in first base, there was only one Puerto Rican who um, who grew up in one player who grew up in Puerto Rico who ended uh, up on first base. And so there's just been too small a group. So what we decided to do was add uh, two Hispanic categories together that come from the U.S. and the U.S. territories. So we added the United States and the Puerto Rican players together. And then we took uh, all the Dominican players and all the other Hispanic ca categories who come from outside the U.S. or U.S. Te territories, and we'll call those Hispanic foreign. And then what we decided to do is break it down by, uh, like I said, every position. And uh, by breaking it down pos by position, we find that black players who I uh, play first base, lower likelihood of exit. Who play third base, lower likelihood of exit. Outfielder, lower likelihood of exit. Utility, infielder or designated hitter, higher likelihood of exit. If we look at Hispanic uh, domestic born, the only significant category of any magnitudes uh, is a uh, catcher catchers have a higher likelihood of exit. If we look at foreign born Hispanics, uh, lower likelihood of exit at second base, third base, catcher, outfield, and utility. Uh, once again, weight and height don't matter. Age does. The older you get, the more likely you'll, you'll exit. Uh, we, al we also find that uh, by breaking it down to categories, Slugging averages matter more for first base, second base, outfield. Um, surprisingly, not for utility. I guess maybe it's because we put um, utility infielders and um, designated hitters together. Uh, but that kind of fo follows the notion that if you're a third base shortstop or catcher, your slugging average doesn't matter because it's your defense performance that matters more. Uh, notice that stolen bases, I'll kind of skip over a few, uh, first base, outfielder, uh, and second base, the more stolen bases you have, the less likelihood of exit. And of course, the more games you play, the less likelihood of exit. If we interpret that, what we find is uh, black players have a 42% likely less lower likelihood of exit than white players. 47% lower likelihood of exit uh, than third baseman and 31% lower likelihood of exit outfielder. However, if they're a designated hitter or utility infielder, 154% more likelihood of exit. Uh, Hispanic players, domestic, the only thing that domestic born was a 61% higher likelihood of exit. So it, when in the aggregate, you don't find it. Uh, foreign born, we find that all of them, second base, third base, catcher, outfield, and utility, a higher likelihood of exit. Uh, once again, I would say take this last bit with a grain of salt because they are relatively small area, uh, small sample sizes or population sizes. Uh, so conclusion, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that foreign born Hispanics have shorter careers than non-Hispanic whites, so there is some foreign discrimination, just like uh, um, Johnny and I 
and uh, Craig Depkin found when we we're looking at um, uh, Europeans and the hockey leagues. But we don't find this when looking at U.S. and Puerto Rican borns. Uh, we also find uh, non-Hispanic blacks are less likely to exit uh, than non-Hispanic whites. So there seems to be some preference for keeping whites. It might be something that we're not measuring. Uh, we, found, we found that particular um, uh, uh, result curious. Uh, positional stacking is definitely there. And this might be due to the lack of training where the outfield takes the less training. Uh, uh, so we see a lot of blacks stacked into the outfield. Even though we find this evidence of the blacks and Hispanics are um, stacked, it's not clear evidence of discrimination. It could be human capital. So that's the conclusion. What do we want to do? Uh, we realize that this is old data. So we would like to redo this and see what's going on today when there's even a smaller percentage of black uh, United States born players. We also realize that Hispanic is really not a racial characteristic. There's uh, Hispanic is African descent, European descent and indigenous descent. And so Johnny and I have talked about maybe trying to do some sort of shade discrimination or colorism discrimination and also one thing we noticed is there's the training. Um, you're moved up from uh, A to double A to triple A to the major league. Is there discrimination going on uh, in, in, in the, the promotion end? I mean, it, it might be more difficult for black players to make it into the league because once they make the league, they don't seem to exit. And so that's uh, our analysis. Thanks for listening. See, how do I unshare my screen? Thank you very much, Pete. Really interesting talk. Uh, even for someone like me, you know, not very much about baseball. Uh, we've got plenty of time for questions, so I'll open up the floor to any questions uh, and while people did start. I yeah, I did. Uh, yes, you did. Yeah. Okay. While I wait for folk to raise their hands, I will uh, take an opportunity to ask one question which perhaps will reveal my ignorance but you mentioned and you said you found this for the NHL as well that you have foreign players you know shorter careers and by career you mean in the American League right 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 and you know kind of thinking of I think you mentioned it you know that they might move back home sooner and I mean just kind of thinking about it um do do you know because often you'll find that players playing in the top league you know in football my sport you know, they'll play there for a short time, you know, kind of five, six years, and then they'll move perhaps to their, you know, a club where they retire at, which if they're English will be a team in England, maybe a lower division team, or if they're foreign, they'll go back home and play at a lower level mm -hmm. back there. I mean, do you observe within, you know, does that happen that players will move from one club to another in a baseball setting, or is that quite unusual? I I, I know that there's a, um, Rich Hill, my co-author, had a son that was going through the, uh, the the system and he told me that some players do sometimes they just know they're never going to make the major leagues and will go play in the foreign leagues in Japan, in Mexico. Um, and so there may be some of that going on that I play for a little bit and then get pulled back. You know, uh, I don't know if there's I don't know enough about uh, Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic to know if there is a professional league there, but they t tend to be poor. Uh, so I'm not sure. Cool, thank you. Uh, Stefan's raised hand up with probably a more informed question than mine. Well, I probably watch more baseball than you do. That's that's sort of silly. <laughs> um, and certainly probably more interested in baseball than <laughs> perhaps you could be on stage. Um, and that uh, was really interesting, um, Pete. And um, uh, I, I, I got a couple of points, I think, which are, so one is, I mean, Overarching this, it seems to me, I mean, the, the statistics you were showing at the beginning seem to be very clear that basically um, black players getting into the major leagues at the beginning are just better than everybody else, right? And yeah. that seems to me, that seems to be a very clear example of Bakirian discrimination, right? And, and we see this across sports and in sports discrimination all the time. If you're, you know, if you're in the minority group, you have to be twice as good as the in group in order to get to get in, and that 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 seems to be a thing. 
And I, so I wonder, and I guess your problem is, is that you don't, what you'd really like to do, what I, and you know, what I did with my discrimination paper in English soccer was say, well, that's your, that's going to lower your value in the market. If, if there's a, if you have to be twice as good, then people are uh, an equivalently talented player is going to be played um, less if they're from the discriminated, if they're, if they're from the group suffering discrimination. That's, that's, that's the basic implication. Um, and I suppose in baseball, the, the, the problem you've got is that you don't have individual salary data or reliable salary data at entry. You have free agent salaries, but that's by the time you're a free agent, probably a lot of those prejudices have gone away because you're actually, you've actually proven what you can do. And it's, it's kind of hard to argue that you're not really that good once you're a seven, six year veteran, right? Um, <laughs> So um, the the so but uh, one thought you could maybe follow would be to be and I think you can get data on this is um, arbitration uh, whether whether players go to arbitration or not because I would say that my hypothesis would be black players are being underpaid that's why they get they're twice you know they're significantly better getting in the ones who get in are having having to prove that they're going to get paid less given their talents. And therefore, and also, they're going to go up for arbitration. Moreover, if the if the owners are discriminating, then they're deliberately paying low wages, at which the players are then going to say, "Well, well, I'm going to take this to arbitration because I don't think this is a fair salary." And so I would, so I think that would be a kind of a potential test of of, of this of this effect. Um, yeah, yeah. Go, I, go. I'd like to actually look closer at the minor leagues to see because you know you get. You, a lot of times you get drafted and then you get a bonus right at the beginning. Um, although I think it's different for the Dominican. My understanding is they're free agents right from the start. So there's no draft system for uh, So it, it, there's a lot. Yeah, but I think there's something definitely going on before they get into to the league, <laughs> like you're right. saying. Yeah. And it yeah. might be that we're finding that negative is because they're already of a higher quality. And so that negative result we're finding is they're holding them on that we're just not measuring that that quality because we, are, because we only have a, what? The hitting statistics and not the fielding statistics. Yes, one problem with baseball yeah. or defensive That's, positions. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the other point I was I was gonna make was, you know, in terms of measuring this, in terms of comparing ability, you could use um, run expectancy as a as a as a better measure. So the, these, you know, the, the it's a, I would say that's a so some kind of um, value based on um, war or something like that. That these these things are now relatively easy to to calculate, um, and um, that I think gives a lot more precision to the quality of the players. You have much better measure of ability. Yeah, that, yeah. So wind against replacement. Yeah, with more recent data set. Yeah, I think I'd like. Yeah. Well, but you can calculate war. I mean, this is what Ryan Pinier and I did for our for our paper in JSC last year, which is it, it's actually it's actually not that difficult to do this. I'm I'm happy to share you the, with you the, the the thing. Ryan, I mean, from you can get all the data from um, um, retro sheet. That's that's all there and. Um, uh, you know, it's it's actually really easy to calculate. So it's not it's not actually a big job. It's actually although it looks it looks fancy, it's actually quite a simple thing to do. Okay. Great. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, any more questions and comments? One, and, and if I, since no one's else talking, I sort of ask, I, I wonder how you think about this in terms of what, what do you think is, to the extent that there is discrimination going on here, how do you think it actually works? Who's, who's, who's making decisions at, at the, and where, how are these decisions playing out? Because that seems to me the, the, sort, of the, the key, sort of the key question is about how the, what's the process here of work? 
some of it I think goes all the way back to the training because I mean, in baseball, it's just got there's there's just not it's expensive and uh, in well what what do they call in the baseball academies uh, because it's not like there's not black players in the major league now. They just all come from Latin America. But that that but again, that doesn't seem to fit with this the, the data that shows that actually the black players when they start their career they're significantly better than the than the white players, right? So that that yeah it's, that yeah there's something about the, the, being the yeah, something about being point. U.S. born. Yeah, I mean. Because this is the because it's the other thing. I mean, and it, it's obviously the thing in America is is also um, the. I mean, it seems to be racism in America works has has a very specific structural form, which is not necessarily the same as in other countries, right? So this thing mm -hmm. about it's um, uh, it, it seems there's a different treatment for Black Americans as opposed to Black Caribbean Black. Yeah. black south american or wherever and oh that's also a question is is how is that actually working do if if you're if you speak spanish and you're from the dominican republic does that mean all other characteristics the same that you're treated the same or do you think it's different i mean i i, I again you you're like you say there's this thing about the, the lack of of development of of, of of baseball for black american kids but then you seem to your data also suggests there's something else that once even when they're trying to get into the to the to the to the teams, then there's still some kind of barrier, prejudice barrier going on. And again, do you have any thoughts about how how that might work? It's a quandary. I don't know if I really do have thoughts <laughs> because there's definitely something going on. I think one thing that one thing that could help is uh, I know Major League Baseball is trying to uh, implement initiatives to improve training for African Americans, and so if we see over time, say maybe the next ten years, that these initiatives increase the number of black players at these other positions, then maybe it's more of a training story than it is a discrimination story. Yeah. No, I mean that that I think that that's that's definitely true. The other thing is when I mean there are only there are only thirty franchises, right? And um, the uh, we know where discrimination takes place in America, right? We know we know where the strongest, um, you know, it's we know where prejudice is strongest, right? Or we have we have some clues at least, and. Couldn't the distribution of the teams actually give you some? You could use some proxies about prejudice, evidence of prejudice in different parts of the country to use that to see whether the teams it's 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 actually something that's associated with the teams themselves. It's a good idea. Hope I didn't bore the rest of the Europeans with a game they don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well it's their loss, right? It's their loss. They don't yeah. <laughs> and also, we knew what the title was, Pete. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if anyone, if anyone has turned up expecting a different sport, that's, uh, that's our problem, not yours, Pete. <laughs> But I think I think yeah, you know the, the data set really very really, really interesting uh, on the characteristics and the performance and the uh, the racial uh, dimension as well really interesting. I mean I guess you're Stefan you're moving in the area of is it customer based discrimination there where you might think that the owners discriminate on the basis of what their fans in the stadium might or they perceive what their fans in the stadium might want to see. Yeah, I, I that 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 could well be true. Although I mean, I I mean it's complicated, right? So I mean, you know, with somewhere like I mean Detroit, it's a strange story. I mean, 
because you know actually the, the the Detroit Tigers historically were seen as being a quite you know racially prejudiced team, right? So particularly back in the back in the forties and fifties, they had this vile owner Briggs who just wouldn't have any black players, didn't want black people coming to the stadium. And of course now Detroit's a majority black city, and the current owners are seen to be very pro integration. But you still have this huge segregation that the city of Detroit is all black. Outside of the city, the suburbs are all white. White people go to watch Tigers games, drive into the city, drive straight out again, spend no time in the city. Um, you know, and, it, and that's that's a, there's so so it's it's often hard to measure. I mean, another way to go it would be to get get a student to do a, a study on um, from press get all the press mentions of owners made, saying racist things because the owners <laughs> say plenty of racist stuff all the time, right? So um, just collect that and see where, where the highest concentration <laughs> of racist commentary are and see if that's correlated with, with which teams they play for. I mean, that seriously, I think that would work. I'm pretty sure you, you, you find that would be a fairly reliable indicator. Because then that's the point. You know, discrimination is not just something that's, that's sort of in the air. Right. It's people making choices, and so the, mm, these mm. And, and our our objective is to reveal how, where, and how these choices yeah, were yeah. made. Right. Mm. Thanks for your comments. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Pete. Uh, we might as well uh, wrap up. Uh, and um, say so thank you very much, Pete. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. Uh, really interesting talk. Uh, obviously, we uh, we pause now and we decide on Sunday whether we watch the uh, the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, but then we've got a talk next week, next Friday, on online poker. Marcus Dirtwinkel Kalt from the University of Munster, Students Preference Evidence from Online Poker. Uh, and then we have a an, an apt talk two weeks' time. Uh, on making a Maradona meat consumption soccer prowess, fitting for perhaps for uh, checking on how Argentina are doing in the World Cup. We've got a couple of uh, good talks lined up, and then we finish up for Christmas on the 9th of December with Brian Mills presenting on racially congruent leadership and firm performance. So I wish you all a good weekend. Hope you enjoy uh, whether you watch the World Cup or not, and uh, let's look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>